From the time Congress makes the first appropriation for a new naval ship until she slides down the ways to take her place in the United States fleet, expert designers and draftsmen, highly trained shipbuilders, and skilled mechanics take part in her construction. The equipment is the best. Guns and machinery are of the latest design. She has the ruggedness of a champion heavyweight prize fighter and yet the precision of an expensive watch. When this delicate assembly of high-powered machinery has her flag raised for the first time, she must be manned by a crew of American Blue Jackets, taught and trained to maintain their ship at the peak of efficiency. Or sturdy towers no longer walk the anchor windows around. Electricity at the touch of the hand performs this and a multitude of other tasks, once accomplished by manpower. In the old days, coaling ship was a frequent job and was accompanied by clouds of coal dust which penetrated every nook and cranny of the ship. On coaling days, the band furnished music, the Blue Jackets turned to with vim, and characteristically, they enjoyed themselves while working. In our modern naval vessels, coal bunkers have been replaced by oil tanks, and fuel is pumped aboard to be burned by multiple burners in clean, ship-shaped fire rooms, furnishing power to drive the vessel and to be converted into electricity be distributed throughout the ship by a complex network of copper for use not only in menial tasks, but in the highly technical job of coordinating gunfire. <laughs> to meet the demands for skilled specialists, the Navy Department maintains at certain shore bases trade schools where recruits chosen for their ability and aptitude are given every opportunity to become proficient in both the theory and practice of their chosen craft. While attending school, the students live in these new and modern buildings amid pleasant surroundings. And here they are, future craftsmen of the Navy in that tip-top physical condition which provides mental alertness and inquisitive minds. The students of all crafts are given thorough instruction in theory, planning, and design. Like the young man in this electrical class, all students evince a keen interest in this phase of their studies. are trained in the classroom, hands are trained by actual shop work. The first project of the student in metalworking is the construction of his own toolbox. In all projects, the efforts of the students are utilized in the production of some tool or piece of equipment having practical value. are proud of their craft. All work is carefully inspected for flaws. Not all projects are as simple as the construction of a toolbox. An old lathe ready for the scrap heap has been dismantled preparatory to being rebuilt by the students. Drawings made in the classroom are first utilized by the students in the carpenter's school. Gears, pulleys, spindles, shafts, and tools for the lathe must be cast, and these students make the patterns for all of them. Although ships are made of steel, there is plenty of work on board for the carpenters. The ship's boats, ship's furniture, and decks must be kept in excellent condition. The students receive instruction in the characteristics of different types of wood, in wood turning, planing, and finishing. Some of these students will later specialize in pattern making, and judging from the appearance of these jobs, the Navy will have some excellent pattern makers. In the foundry, the molding students draw a carefully weighed blend of molten metal from the cupola. Then they transport it in pots to the molds where it's poured. When the molten metal cools, it becomes the rough casting from which the parts of the lathe are made.
with a clang of steel against steel, the blacksmith students take their part in the project by forging the tools and accessories for the lathe. And finally, the students in the machine shops receive the rough castings and lathe tools for finishing and assembly. Milling the flutes on a drill presents one of the first milling machine problems. Finishing counterbores and reamers teaches the student to work to close tolerances. Not much buzz from this power saw, but it accomplishes the task, saving many hours of hand labor. Inspections by competent instructors during every stage of the machining gives assurance that a large percentage of the work will pass final inspection. Gear cutting requires care and precision in order that the gears may operate quietly and smoothly. The shaper is used to finish special shapes not adapted to a milling machine or lathe. With slow but powerful reciprocating movements, the shaper trims the parts to the desired size and shape. Finishing some parts, such as these drive pulleys, are simple turning jobs. But machining them acquaints the student with the operation of the lathe control. Rapid but thorough inspection with square and scale. The V belt rides smoothly and snugly in the groove. The instructor is an expert and no errors pass unnoticed. Then the assembly of all parts into one unit, a lathe equal in all respects to a new lathe, all components precision made humming together, sweet music to a machinist's ear. Electrical students learn the mysteries of electrical instruments used on a ship's bridge. Their studies include not only the care, repair, and operation of electrical power machinery, but also the devices used in interior communication such as this automatic dial telephone with its intricate wiring system. In the aviation machinist school, the students are taught aircraft motor theory and the practical work of assembling, repairing, and overhauling aircraft engines. Later, these motors will be taken to the test stand for trial runs, where the instructor will introduce defects and faults which the student must locate and remedy. Maintaining aircraft in perfect operating condition involves great responsibility, and these students must be prepared to meet all emergencies. No chance for an error as long as micrometer precision is required. Wire rigging plays an important part in aircraft construction. Students are taught wire splicing, testing, and associated subjects. The splices must be expertly made and carefully tested in the stress of varying weights. The aviation machinists work in conjunction with the aviation metalsmiths who receive instruction in welding, sheet metal work, and coppersmith. When the students graduate, they have gained fundamental knowledge and training in their craft. On board ships of the fleet, their studies and practical experience continue. By maintaining modern and well-equipped schools and by having expert instructors both ashore and afloat, the Navy solves its problem of providing skilled men to operate the complex oil, steam, and electrical machinery of our sea fortresses of today. Making craftsmen for America's first line of defense is a project well done by the Navy.
One of Uncle Sam's new cruisers is speeding across the Atlantic on the first leg of a shakedown cruise, which in the Navy means a long voyage to test the equipment and to train the crew. Every blue jacket aboard is in high spirits. The blue Mediterranean is ahead, and there will be many ports of call. And you know a blue jacket has a good time wherever he goes, whether it's New York, China, or Timbuktu. Naturally, every man wants the ship to look its best after the long run from the States, so all hands turn to. Everything must be ship-shaped. There's plenty of paint, polish, and elbow grease. Finally comes the command, let go the anchor. A clatter of iron and the chain rushes down through the hawse pipes. Cheerful music to the Blue Jackets, for it means shore lead. Navy's out to see the sights in the little British town at the base of the big rock. Gibraltar, though in Spain, is an English possession. They found out one thing already. Whoever built Gibraltar must have run out of stones when they got around to the sidewalk. Steady, boy. Gangway. Here's a spot where we can get a good look at the rock. Where's that big sign you see in the magazine ads? I'll be a monkey's uncle if I know. Guess the company didn't pay its bill and they took it off. Well, let's go up and find out about that. Look out, sailor. Remember, you have sea legs, and it's a long way up. They don't know why they want to get up there, but it's something to do, so that's reason enough for a blue jacket. In the centuries gone by, a lot of invading armies tried this stunt, but they didn't get very far. Well, Columbus took a chance, so here goes anyhow. Look out, sailor. Now look what happened. Another ruined weekend. Pull yourself together, mate. There's a lot to see here, and we haven't much time. The local garage man's willing to help. Ah, yes, for a hundred francs, they can see all the spots of local interest. For two more francs, he'd sell them the whole works. If this isn't the life, I don't know what is. A French chauffeur and miles of scenery, free for the looking. This is a lot better than a driver chauffeur. The driver doesn't speak English. You go where he takes you. But it's all for, so who cares? One part of the Riviera country is as interesting as the other. This Mediterranean cruise is a beaut. Visiting firemen think they're pretty swell. Say, there's nothing compared to visiting sailors. shore leave, we see new sights, new people, Spanish, French, Italian, and now some of those North African folks. Tunis, with its graceful minarets, gives promise of real adventure. Give the Navy a day ashore, and they know as much about the town as the residents themselves. Picturesque bazaars and markets, and now some old ruins on the outskirts. The natives say these are the ruins of an old Roman Colosseum, built centuries before Uncle Sam had Navy, so we'll give it the once over. In a couple of hours, we're going to know more about it than an archaeologist. Well, you can't help but say life in the Navy is great.
around the ruins and over the ruins, and now to find out what's underneath. Perhaps a buried city or a suit to take home to the girlfriend. Well, full speed ahead, have yourself a time, because nobody cares much about these old ruins anyway. The owner broke the lease long ago. There's no bad feeling in this treasure hunt. It's one for all and all for one. Ports of call are plenty on this Mediterranean cruise, but there's only one Venice. What a thrill when the ship heads toward the Grand Canal. It's no wonder Venice is called the Queen of the Adriatic. gondolas looking for customers are all the merchants of Venice. What a show! This historic city has the boys running around in circles, but somehow everyone ends up here in St. Mark's Square, where you find the famous pigeons that are fed by the tourists. The mechanical clockmen are famous the world over. They've been hammering out the hours for a couple of centuries. Talk about your mailman who goes walking on his day off. Here's a real sailor's holiday. They just got off a boat, and now they're getting in another one. But after all, Venice wouldn't be Venice without a ride in the gondola. No work in the singing oarsman. This is the real way to see Venice, the city of romance and grandeur. Words don't begin to describe it, so we'll let the Venetian atmosphere speak for itself.